Today's lecture is going to focus on intelligence. So due to my earlier illness, uh, we skipped over um, introduction to thinking, and we're going to move straight into intelligence. Um, so I hope you guys don't mind. Feel free to ask me any questions if there's something that you wanted to know about uh, organizational thinking and how our, our brain organizes concepts into schemas and categories and, and things of that nature. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, and if you guys are interested, I'd also be happy to post the slides as well. I just won't be able to go into a full lecture. <clears throat> I'm still a bit hoarse, so do excuse me if I cough or take regular sips of water. So, we all have this basic idea of what intelligence is. You know, intelligence is your mental capacity, right? It's, it's what you are mentally able to do. Well, we, um, we've created a measure called an intelligence quotient, uh, which looks at your mental age in comparison to your actual age. Um, and, and so we use that as a measure for intelligence. And what we do is, is we, we actually norm it around 100. So every single time that someone takes the intelligence test, um, it changes. Their score changes the impact, and as a result, we actually see higher and higher scores over time. So we have to renorm the IQ test so that each time it's around the score of 100. That's because what we expect of different individuals uh, at different ages changes relative to uh, what they're learning. So, uh, for example, I might <clears throat> expect more of my nieces when it comes to what they're learning in school than perhaps I did at that age. Similar to that, my mom expected more of me than she was expected to know in her age. So this is what we're talking about when I say that the um, the information that leads to a score of 100 changes over time and we have to renorm it. Right? So this is called the Flynn effect. So intelligence is this inborn mental capacity and it's normed at around a score of 100. So most people fall between one standard deviation, which is 15. So most people fall between a score of 85 and 115. That's pretty common for people to fall within that score range. 95% of all people fall within two standard deviations. That means 70 to 130. So anything over 130 is considered of superior intellect. Anything below 70 is considered borderline mentally challenged. In fact, once you get technically 70 is the cutoff for mentally challenged. So once you get far below that, that's where you start to see um, lower levels of intelligence. Next lecture, we're going to get into some of the biases about this and some over-representation uh, issues. For example, men are overrepresented in both ends of the continuum. That is, that there are far more male geniuses than there are female geniuses, but there are also far more mentally challenged men than there are women. So we're going to talk about some of these biases. For example, there's also the bias that um, white people uh, and white people from middle and upper class tend to score better than black people or people of other races as well. And we're going to talk about some of the biases that lead to that and whether or not that represents true intelligence or some artifact of the measure itself. So intelligence is widely seen in all cultures to be the ability to learn from our experiences, kind of figure out the solutions to a problem, and use that information to help guide future behavior. So, um, you know, I, I work in government, and we, we talk a lot about lessons learned. You know, it's, we, we always write papers on, you know, what are the lessons learned? And one of the key things that we talk about is the difference between lessons learned and lessons observed. And intelligence is key to lessons learned. So if you see the information, you take it in, but you don't change your behavior, then you're not really learning. And that's what we're talking about here with intelligence is, you know, that you can observe something, but unless you can actually apply that to a different area of your life, have you really truly learned it? In other words, if you're not able to take that information and adapt it in some way, shape, or form to fit your needs, have you actually really learned it, or have you just memorized it? One of the problems, though, 
is that this general concept of intelligence tends to measure one thing specifically, school smarts. And this is one of those inherent biases within intelligence tests, because we're asking people information that they should have learned in an academic environment. So if you have people, uh, let's say for instance, uh, you have uh, one person that is born uh, in the United States and has access to a quality education, enough food, and you put you take someone from sub-Saharan Africa who doesn't really um, have a lot of educational experience, not as much access to food, and, and the question then becomes inborn intelligence. Well, clearly the individual that's in the United States that has access to education and a high quality diet is going to perform better on a measure of intelligence. So the question then is, is that level of intelligence that we're measuring inborn, or is that, um, you know, teaching to the test? In other words, uh, you know, are we giving the people the information they need to score well on intelligence tests and missing the actual underlying factor of intelligence? There's a lot of evidence to suggest that that's, that's going on to some degree. In fact, one of the things that, that we use to examine these biases are infant intelligent tests. So infant intelligence tests are um, unique because infants can't provide an answer. So what they can provide is gaze. And that's what we measure. And what we see is that children who are more intelligent, when they are at a very young infant age, will gaze for longer periods of time than less intelligent peers at novel information. So if you remember way back when, when we were talking about object permanence, we were talking about how babies could kind of realize that, um, you know, when something gets taken away, it still exists. So, um, you know, we had the, the example of, um, you know, two things um, and then you cover them with a box. They see you take one away, but then when you lift the box, they're both still there. So infants with higher intelligence will stare at that and try and figure it out for longer than children with lower intelligence. And in fact, we see that this trend carries on and it's actually a, a, a decent measure of intelligence. And in that regard, what we see is that there's a lot less bias there. There's a, few, a lot fewer gender um, disparities uh, and racial disparities as well. So our common IQ tests that we have right now measure academic school smarts and those abilities. But is that all that intelligence really is? Well, there's a lot of conflict there. You know, we, we talk about intelligence being some sort of a thing. You know, that, that I have this much intelligence. Well, that's reification. That's, that's, it's, it's not a legitimate examination of what intelligence is. Intelligence is intangible, and it's also situation dependent. So one of the things we're going to talk about is the different types of intelligence that you can have. And if intelligence is a specific trait or a thing, then it wouldn't be able to be fluid like that. So intelligence is a very abstract concept. It's not really a thing. So the two big questions in intelligence are, is it a single ability or group of abilities? And then after that, what can we do to locate it and measure it within the brain? So what about if it's one ability versus many abilities? Well, lots of people have examined this in a lot of different contexts. And what we find is that it can be viewed in both ways. So um, some of us have different types of abilities, uh, for instance, I'm great with my hands. I can build things really well. I enjoy building things. Um, I'm, I'm also pretty decent with my mind. Um, but when it comes to things like dance, I am not graceful. And so these are different types of intelligence that we're going to examine. And the way that you can test this is by thinking about what you're skilled at and thinking, well, does this have to necessarily correlate with that? And what we see is that oftentimes different types of intelligence don't highly correlate. So the first way that we looked at it was this, what we call the G factor. 
So general intelligence is the G factor. And it's basically something that uh, Charles Spearman created uh, when, when looking at people's responses to different measures. Excuse me. Now, we haven't talked a lot about factor analysis, and that's because it's, it's kind of complex. So let me explain it in, in a simple way. Basically, uh, factor analysis means that you have a whole lot of data, and you find pieces of data that fit well together, and you group them into a, a, a group. So for example, let's say that I have one giant factor known as produce, right? Plants. Okay, so that giant factor can be broken down into a number of different categories. You can do a broad basic factor analysis where you break it down into the key components of three different types. You've got, actually we'll, we'll do four different types. Fruits, vegetables, grains, and non-edibles. Right, so that's the basic factor analysis, but then you can actually parse it down even further into different types of fruits and different types of vegetables. And so that's what factor analysis really does. It breaks down a lot of data into recognizable, easily groupable chunks. And you can bring it down lots of levels or you can bring it down only a few levels. And the determination as to whether or not you break it down into lots of levels or only a few levels has to do with statistics and how we determine whether or not two groups are statistically different enough to go ahead and group them. So Charles Spearman did factor analysis and he identified a G factor, this general intelligence where there's lots of correlations between the different aspects. So he hypothesized that general intelligence is comprised of many clusters. And these clusters can be analyzed by factor analysis, but that for the most part, they still remain part of this G factor. So, um, you know, going back to the idea of what factor analysis is, this is an example that he used. People that work well on vocabulary tend to do well on paragraph comprehension. So if they tend to score well on these two things at the same time, then maybe those are part of the same type of intelligence, some sort of verbal intelligence. And then on the other end, you could have spatial ability. I'm not very good at spatial reasoning. It's just not something I'm skilled at. So that would fall under a reasoning ability or spatial ability factor. And so we seem to excel at certain types of intelligence and fail at others. So if general intelligence was highly correlated, then we could say, yes, that is a basic construct. Some people disagreed, specifically Thurstone. Um, he believed that it was not G, but instead it was actually these seven clusters. So mental ability breaks down into word fluency, verbal comprehension, spatial ability, perceptual speed, numerical ability, inductive reasoning, and memory. So each of these are a key component of someone's ability to perform mentally, or a measure of intelligence. So one can have an exceptional verbal fluency or verbal comprehension, have exceptional scores in both of those, but then perform poorly in spatial ability, perceptual speed, and numerical ability. So this is why, um, you know, for many people, they, they always get so flustered when they take the SAT or the GRE because it seems so frustrating to, to, to score really well in one of those categories and just miserable in the other. And that happens a lot because these primary mental abilities are not always correlated. Some of them are very well correlated with one another, but some of them aren't. So when we look at Thurstone's data, we do see support for a G factor. So the idea here is that general intelligence does exist. Like I said, um, you know, some of these can be really highly correlated with one another. For example, word fluency and verbal comprehension tend to be fairly highly correlated. Um, other things, for example, numerical ability and inductive reasoning, 
more likely to be highly correlated with one another. But these don't necessarily line up with those. So what later psychologists realized by reanalyzing Thurstone's data is that some of these have strong relationships, but a lot of them have weak general relationships. These weak general relationships provide some support for that G factor or that general intelligence. The idea that if some of these provide only a small aspect of what we can measure as of intelligence, then there is some sort of greater G that contains all of them. And with that in mind, we use the IQ scale, and there's a number of different ones, but this one down here is from the Weschler. Um, there's the Weschler, there's the Whisk, there's, there's a couple of different ones, and it depends on you know, if you're what age uh, that you're dealing with, uh, but there are a number of IQ tests. And they all center with an average score of 100, and two-thirds fall within one standard deviation of the mean. So one standard deviation of the mean means the average plus or minus 15 points. Now the 15 points, that's the standard deviation for intelligence. So not everything has a standard deviation of 15. This applies to intelligence only. So most people score between 70 and 130 on an IQ scale. 95% of people score between 70 and 130. The other 2% on each side is another standard deviation. But beyond that is only 0.1% of the population. So the majority of the population falls within two standard deviations of the mean. But, as I said with factor analysis, one of the things that you can do with factor analysis is look at a general factor in a number of different ways. So sure, you can do general intelligence, but you can also break it down into these subcategories. And what we see is that these categories must be actual because what we note is that some individuals can excel in one area of general intelligence and fail miserably in, in one or many others. So a perfect example is individuals with savant syndrome who excel in abilities that are not generally related to general intelligence. Um, but they may also excel in one area of general intelligence but still perform very poorly on standard measures of IQ. So Savant Syndrome provides some support to the idea that intelligence comes in multiple forms. Now Gardner was the individual that, that sort of said, hey, you know, that there clearly are different categories. However, he didn't like Thurstone's categories. So he came up with his own. He came up with eight categories, which is linguistic, logical, mathematical, musical, spatial, bodily kinesthetic, interpersonal, interpersonal with other people, and naturalist. He also hypothesized the ninth one, which was existential intelligence. But the question here is, how different are these types of intelligence from Thurstone's types of intelligence? <clears throat> well, different. Definitely different. And part of the reason why is because that's how statistics operates. You can group things in a number of different categories in different ways. So if you remember I was talking about the example of doing a factor analysis on um, all produce. Well, you could break it down into, you know, the, the four different categories. Or you could break it down even further. Or you could completely ignore one of those factors, which is the non-edible, and, and only look at edible produce. So there's a lot of different ways that you can look at information statistically speaking. And as a result of that, it makes it a little bit sticky. So there's some overlap between Gardner and Thurstone, and there's some areas where they don't match up. And that's because they looked at the data in a slightly different manner. In statistics, we have a, a delightful joke, so it's it's a little racy, so I do apologize if you get offended, but um, this is my favorite joke about statistics. Statistics are like a good prostitute. Once you lay them down, you can do pretty much anything you want to them. And that's very true, and this is a case in point. 
where what we see is that we have two individuals looking at a large group of data and pulling different conclusions from them. So this is the risk of statistics. However, people analyze the data again after the fact and provide support to it. So that's how we try to fall out of that pitfall uh, of having, you know, statistical bullshit going on. So somebody else got a hold of Gardner's data and said, you know what, I think you're right about these categories, but I think they actually fit into three larger groups. In other words, some of these factors fit together and create new larger factors. <clears throat> As such, you should have three categories instead of eight. So those three were analytical intelligence, and that's what we typically test in schools. Then there's creative intelligence, which makes us able to adapt to new situations and generate new ideas. <clears throat> and then practical intelligence, that which is required for the ability to do things every day. In other words, street smarts. So the idea here was that you can take all of those and recategorize them into three more cohesive, easier to understand categories. So if you haven't figured it out yet, we don't have a good handle on what makes intelligence a thing. In fact, it's not really a thing. It's an abstract concept. And due to its abstract nature, that is part of why we can't get a good handle on it. In fact, some people have gone so far as to create an entirely different type of intelligence that has no similar level or basis in um, the types of intelligence that we classically think about, ones that can be scored and measured. And that's emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence can be broken down into four ways, and it deals with your ability to handle emotions. So those four ways are your ability to perceive emotion. And this is something that people with autism tend to really struggle with. Being able to recognize the emotions within the faces. Understanding the emotions. So that's not only understanding how emotions change and what causes that change, but then using that information to predict emotions so that you're not surprised when somebody's upset with you. And you can work your best way to manage your emotion in that situation, which is that third step of emotional intelligence, which means that you know when it's appropriate to use certain phrases or emotional statements. And then lastly, the ability to fully utilize your emotions in an adaptive and creative way. So emoting properly. Now, certainly not everybody scores high on emotional intelligence, it's not just people with autism. Lots of people fail in some of these components. But the question is, is that a measure of intelligence? Many people say no. Some people criticize this idea as saying that we're stretching the idea of measurable intelligence too far when we apply it to emotions. I, You know, I mean, that's... I'm kind of stuck on this one because when it comes down to it, it's a very sticky issue. All intelligence is very sticky. We think that we have something right and then it comes out and we're like, wait a minute, there's a bias here. So the measure of intelligence is, is certainly too new. And in fact, the use of an IQ test mainly started to capture people coming to Ellis Island and make sure that we had people that were smart enough to be here. So it wasn't even, it was a practical test. It was never intended to be something where, you know, you have to, you know, you, you get a membership to Mensa. That was never the intention of the IQ test. It was a simple test to make sure people were smart enough to come to this country. So it's still very sticky. It had specific purposes in the beginning. Those purposes have changed, and as a result, we need to question some of the biases that led to the creation of that measure. Now, one of the things um, when we get into personality that we're going to talk a lot about is openness to experience or creativity. And creativity is something that's highly correlated with intelligence because it deals with novelty. And so standard measures of intelligence 
find that people, you know, when someone scores high on intelligence, they're able to adapt creatively. As a result, creativity is inherently going to be highly correlated with intelligence. And what it relates to are these five factors. So, so basically, um, you can be creative if you have these five factors. The expertise, which means that you know enough about the material. So in other words, I would not, I would be ill-suited to come up with a creative solution to an auto repair problem. In fact, I've asked questions on Ask Mechanic before because that's just not my area of expertise. Now, if I were asked to uh, come up with a creative design for an experiment, oh hell yes, I'm all over that. doesn't matter what field. I've come up with biological experiments. I probably wouldn't be able to come up with physics experiments, but psychological, sociological, and biological, I can do that because I have the well-developed knowledge base. Now, something that doesn't come from learning is that imaginative thinking. You can improve this um, by getting around what's known as functional fixedness, your, your inherent inclination to um, think of things as only operating in one way. So you can encourage imaginative thinking, but you can't teach it. Same with an adventuresome personality. You have to be interested in new experiences instead of just following the pack and doing what you're told. And then, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And one of the things is that, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, if any of you have ever taken a creative-based class, uh, for instance, creative writing or an art class, um, you know, sometimes it, it, it's difficult to, to get into an assignment because you're, you're extrinsically motivated by that grade. So intrinsic motivation is being motivated from within. And if you don't have that, you're going to have a much more difficult time being truly creative. And lastly, you need an environment that lends itself well to creativity. So in certain environments, creativity is not encouraged. And as a result, creativity does not come about. So here are some examples of an, a creative versus a non-creative environment. These are two pieces of artwork from two of my favorite people as far as art is concerned. On the left hand side you have a Michael Kulik original um, and this is something that he made um, because this is his career path but it's something that he really enjoys and it was a, a very creative endeavor in his own experience. He had a creative environment to work in because he had no you know he didn't have a buyer in mind it was just something that he was creating. On the right hand side we have a photograph taken by my best friend. Now she is a phenomenal photographer, but this is not one of her best pieces because this was a classroom assignment. She had specific criteria that she had to work with and so she had less wiggle room for creativity. So this is an example of how having a creative environment is necessary to, well it's one of the key components to being able to utilize your creative potential. So again, creativity is highly related to standard measures of intelligence. And on to that last question that we asked, remember we asked the two questions. Well, the second question was how can we measure intelligence? We're going to talk a lot about that in the next lecture. But one of the first ways that we can look at brain functioning is by seeing how well people are able to perceive stimuli. And what we see is that people that score higher on measures of intelligence perceive the stimuli at a faster rate and they retrieve the information from memory quicker to provide a solution. In other words, a response time. So the question is the long side on the left or the right. People that are more intelligent will be able to answer that question in a faster fashion. So this goes back to what we were talking about with memory and that working memory space. If you recall I mentioned that people with higher intelligence tend to have larger working memory. In fact working memory is a good proxy for intelligence and that's part of why if they have a large working memory they can bring the information from their working memory, uh, bring it from the long-term memory into working memory, operate on it very quickly, and get a response out at a much faster rate. So that's how we can do one type of testing with intelligence. 
Uh, next lecture, we're going to talk about the standard forms of intelligence testing. And we're also going to examine environmental and behavior, biological factors that impact that, as well as some biases that impact the reporting of the scores. So that's it for today's lecture. I'm sorry about having missed a week. Um, you know, I got a brutal cold if you didn't catch up on that on Reddit. I got a really nasty cold and then, of course, Hurricane Sandy. But feeling a lot better. Um, next lecture, we're going to focus on those uh, environmental and biological factors that impact intelligence. Feel free to ask me any questions, and I'll talk to you next time. Have a great day.